Hi, today I'd like to talk about why I think it's really, really important that you do your own motherboard repair if you're a store that offers laptop repair or liquid damage repair of any kind. And uh, the, you know, I just want to kind of go over some, some trip down memory lane here from a company that we used to outsource to a long time ago. So this, as you can see, this is, this is, this is fucking ancient garbage, but this, this board had an issue. Uh, you, you guys can guess, uh, you guys who have been watching this channel for a while, what was the original issue with this board. So let me just show you under the microscope what, what they wound up doing to it and what wound up happening. So we wound up getting this thing back and it, was, it didn't work. And it looks like this. So when we contacted them, they said that, oh, the guy, what he did was he couldn't get it to boot into an operating system, but to make sure that he could get video, he booted it into a Linux live CD and he did not boot into a graphical environment because he couldn't get it to boot into a graphical environment. So once that worked, they considered it fixed, sent it back a hundred something bucks and that's that. Yeah, I mean, obviously this is not going to boot in a Mac OS 10 if it can't even boot in a fucking XFCE, but it would boot into a command line. And when we talk, talked to the, the owner about that, then he talked to his technician and the technician talked back to him. What resulted was... A, a large deal of fury and rage at the fact that they wasted a chip that, that he could not get paid on. And, and here's the thing, you know, w with stuff like this, it may have been just as unfixable here as it would have been there, but the difference is if I'm doing the board repair here, I can tell my customer in one day or two days exactly what the deal is. Every time they call in, instead of saying, we have no new status updates at this time, we can say, it's looking good, or we can say this is looking like a nightmare, it's probably not going to get done. And here's the thing about customer service. When you tell somebody up front what the deal is, even if it's really, really bad news, they can live with it. They're going to hate them, you know, they're going to hate their kid for playing games with, in bed with pillows around the laptop. They're going to hate themselves for dropping it. They're going to hate, you know, their wife for spilling water in it. They're going to hate Apple for making it not durable, but, with, with, but, but they're not going to hate you. But when you outsource it and it takes you weeks upon weeks upon weeks upon months to get stuff back and you get back stuff like this and you think it's working and you say, okay, the status says it's good, we should have it done in two days and it shows up like this, the problem is, the problem that you're going to have is it's, they're going to hate you. They are going to hate you. Not Apple, not the person who broke it, not themselves. They hate you. And that sucks. And, uh, and honestly, I understand where they're, I understand why this happens. I, I, cause I'll, you know, a lot of the stuff that I've been getting since I started this YouTube channel. So the board repairs I used to get were, you know, easy, breezy, beautiful cover girl, like stuff that was basic, simple. I spend 10 or 20 minutes. I'm done. Now the stuff that I'm getting is just completely sodomized garbage. I mean, missing balls under the SMC, missing pads near the PCH, uh, no clock signal, ISL circuit destroyed, 50125 circuit destroyed, backlight circuit destroyed, V-core circuit destroyed, every single SMC sensor circuit destroyed. And when I take on that job and I actually do it, there may be a chance that one of those little corroded piles of shit just so happen to corrode further on the way back to you. But the thing is, if you are outsourcing it, you don't really know what kind of the condition and what's going on and all that stuff. The same way that you do when you're the one looking at it, when you're the one working on it, when you're the one who, who, know, who has that direct communication with your customer. So when I am doing this work, if I see a board that's totally destroyed and I know that somebody that wants a one-day turnaround, I can set their expectation accordingly and say, here. Whereas if somebody has an expectation of one or two weeks and they come in and it's something basic, I can say, okay, I'll take it. And that, that kind of communication gets lost in outsourcing. The other thing that I want to mention that's something that is, you know, I know it's something that a lot of people don't want to admit or talk about, but it is, it is in fact true. So when you're outsourcing to a store or a business like one of these, like mine, uh, you know, when people walk in the door and then they went to Apple where the price was 750 to 1800 depending on the model of the machine, they are more than happy to pay the three to 400 whatever here to have the board and the other liquid damage crap fixed. But when you're dealing with a store, they are, uh, you know, m my experience most of the time is that they absolutely shit and crap themselves at $200 which is sometimes understandable because sometimes people will send me boards from 2010 that are worth 200 when they work and ask me to fix them. And you have to realize like in, in the pile, in, in the scheme of things, um, you know, people who want to pay retail price and are happy, then on the bottom of the pile are going to be people who don't want to pay wholesale price 
and are, are kind of complaining about it. So people who come into my store directly, not indirectly through another business, so people who either mailed me a device directly or people who walked in my store directly, they ultimately are going to get that type of priority treatment, not only just because they're paying more, but also because they chose me. So the fact that they chose me means that, you know, I, you're my priority over the customer that then chose somebody else that then sent it here. And that, that doesn't even have to do with price. And it may not seem fair, but it is what it is. And it also has to do with, let's say, just business reputation. So other businesses that are going to send work in, they are never going to leave a positive review. In fact, other businesses usually don't want their customers to know that they outsource this work. They have no interest in letting their customers know that they mail it off because they don't have the capability to do it. So what you're going to find if you're a business that caters to wholesale clients is that it's going to be really difficult to build a reputation because you're not going to get those five-star reviews on this, all the so different social media platforms because you know, when you do a bad job, people, you, you, you'll, hear, you'll, you'll see your name on the internet. But when you do a good job, you often won't see your information out there because the store doesn't want others to know that you're the one doing the work. You know, just, just how it is. So, and, and again, what I notice is that the most destroyed boards recently have just been coming from wholesale people where they are just, I look at it and it just looks like somebody pissed on it with acid and put it in an oven. So the other thing about not outsourcing that's really great comes with this board over here. So this is a board that has been sitting here for so fucking long that this actually dates back to when a lot of board repair here was outsourced. I mean, this is, this is, this has been, I don't know why we didn't recycle this, but this has been sitting here for a really, really, really long fucking time. I mean, just really long. And the person came in to pick it up, and it didn't work. Now, here's the thing. Again, here's the thing with the whole mailing out process. Sometimes it's because the board repairer is an idiot. Sometimes it's because they are just overworked, and the board is destroyed, and they just miss something. It happens. Sometimes people miss things. I know that I miss things every now and then. But the thing is, if I miss something, and somebody comes in to pick up, Steve can walk to the back and say, like, Lewis, what the fuck? And I can go, okay, flip the iron on, whoops, ding, 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 and fix it. With outsourcing, what you have to do is say, oh, I'm sorry. That'll be another, oh, I'm not really sure how long because I don't really know how to fix this and I don't know how long it's going to take and I don't know what type of problem it is. Sorry. And what you're going to find is that your customers are not really happy hearing that as an option. They're not going to be happy with that total lack of information. Again, that's, what it, that's what's going to be what makes them mad at you. It's not even going to be the situation. It's going to be how you present the situation and the fact that you have no information on what's going on. So with this machine, so this was, hand, again, we're going to go over this and we're going to make this thing work and because I, you know, I can kind of see what the guy did and I, I'm going to follow along in the footsteps of that most likely very, very overworked person. And we're going to see what's going on with it. So this is an 820-2879 motherboard, which is really, really, really old. I usually, you know, I highly encourage people to not have these fixed because it's something else is just going to go wrong with it again. So when I plug in the charger, let's take this fucking antique and toss it in there. So when I plug in the charger... Let's see, there's no green light. So the first thing I'm going to measure is the PP3V42 line because that's required for communication with the charger. So what I'm going to do here is I'm going to walk through the process of trying to figure out why this has no green light. So to have a green light, you're supposed to have the 3.42 volt rail. And when I check for the 3.42 volt rail, I have zero volts. Now one of the hints here that the 3.42 volt rail at one time had ripple or was worked on is going to be covered under the microscope here. So this here is U6901, which I've gone over in many, many one-wire circuit videos, so feel free to search for that if you are confused. So you can see that this probably had a one-wire circuit problem originally, and that one-wire circuit problem is why they had to fill up this via with solder and run some type of wire. And you can also see over here that the PP3V42 regulator was re most likely replaced. So what I'm guessing happened here is they looked at the top side of the board, but because they were tired, they didn't look at the bottom side of the board. Now when we look at the bottom side of the board, this here is the resistor 
that goes between the DCN, the DCN, so from the adapter, and the PP3V42 power supply input. So what I'm guessing happened here is that that resistor most likely was not looked at because they did all the work on this with one side of the computer. So let's just take a look and see what that measures and see if I'm correct. So that resistor is usually something like 10 or I would guess something like 10 ohms, 10 ohms or 47 ohms. I'm not really sure at the moment. I should probably look that up. So let's just switch over to screen capture, which is not working. Great. Window capture. Here we go. Okay. But we're on window capture now. So let's go to U6990 over here. So between the DC inboard and here, hey, nice try. So, anyway, so between the DC inboard and here, you're supposed to get uh, one ohm on R6905. And let's just go over to the board view software just so that I can confirm that that's it. Uh, so for some reason, my display capture is not working. So I have to use window capture. The only thing is every time I switch back and forth between windows, it, it you know, I have to actually change the setting in open broadcaster, which really sucks. It's something that I have to look into. So let's just go back over here and change the window. Yay. What a waste of time. Okay. So that resistor, I'm guessing, is this one over here. So yeah, R6905. See right on the bottom left of the screen where it says R6905? So now I'm going to switch back over to the, this view in the microscope. I'll show you how I'm going to measure the resistor. So I put one lead on the bottom, the other lead on the top. And what I get on my multimeter, let's just show you. Let's see if you, you have a view of the multimeter. Eh, barely. Yeah, barely. Got to get an HDMI. I have to get the Fluke 15B with HDMI output. Yeah, the light from the ceiling is owning it. Let's see if we do that a little. So let's see if you can see the resistance once I get out of the way. Now the resistance that I'm getting is 59.6 kilo ohms, whereas the schematic says the resistance is supposed to be 1 ohm. And that's no good. That's not what's supposed to be happening here. So that resistor was probably, you know, it didn't look really amazing. And you could see that there was a little spot right over here where it's, you know, this side looks good. That side looks like it's seen better days. But again, this is the thing. You know, again, when you're doing the work, you, you're going to care about your own customers more than somebody else is going to. Again, and that's, that's just the way the world works. You know, you may not like it. You may say it's unfair. But this, this, is, also, this is just the way the world works. You know, other people are not going to care about your customers the same way that you care about your customers. And if you want to do this type of work, it's, it's a lot easier to deal with all the potential nightmares that come up when you're the one who's, who's fixing it. So again, you know, this, this person decided they're going to go out to lunch and they're totally fine with the fact that it's going to take a little longer because they left their computer here for, the, you know, over three fucking years. So... There's not really much room for them to complain about having to wait 10 minutes since I waited since 2011-12. Okay. Now we get a resistor to put over there. It is crooked, which is the hallmark of almost everything I do in life. But what am I going to do? So, some flux even out the stuff on the sides that blobbed out. 
a little bit of scraping, and then some hot air is going to move that into place so that it looks nice and sits properly. Beautiful. Now I'm going to check and make sure there's no short to ground on both sides before turning this back on. No short to ground on one side of the resistor. And short to ground on the other side of the resistor. Great. Okay. So now the only thing that could be shorted is C6990. So I'm going to look in the board view for C6990 here. And you can get replaced as well. Just making sure that the capacitor that I took was the same voltage rating and also microfarad rating. So, 10 microfarad, 25 volts. Okay, now let's make sure that the short to ground has disappeared on the meter. Red probe ground, black probe on that side of here. Short to ground is gone, so when I plug this in, it should turn on. So what do I get? Do I get a green light? I do not get a green light. Huh. Am I being trolled? I believe I am. Now let's take a look at the rest of that beautiful handiwork. Is that thing soldered well? I would bet no. Before I had nothing on PP3V42, now I have one volt, which is better. And that's definitely progress. But what I'm ideally looking for is 
last, that resistor is actually bad. So the resistor that I put on in place of the one that I said was bad was also bad. Beautiful. Dumb, dumb, dumb. This one. So what I need here is a one ohm resistor that can take a lot of power. You know what? One ohm resistor that can take a lot of power. Nah, too big. Here we go. I'm gonna have to find a better looking resistor than that. I just wanted to finish the video and get the point across. So the whole idea here is again, this, this could have went one of two ways. If I was doing outsourcing, this could have went where I'm sending this back and I'm waiting weeks and weeks and weeks and there's a real, real uncomfortable conversation to have or this could go where I am talking to them and saying, you know, give, give me an hour, go get lunch and come back. And it's gonna happen, you're gonna get owned. If, if your business is based on working on liquid damage stuff the way that mine is, Sometimes you're just going to get owned. It's just, it is what it is. I mean, that's, and it's something that you have to explain to your customers and that they have to understand before you start working on their liquid damaged pile of crap. But at the same time, you can avoid getting owned if you're the one doing the work. Because when you're the one doing the work, when any, any time any one of these little mishaps comes up, you can resolve it in your office instead of having to resolve it by wasting a lot of time and making somebody really unhappy. So with, with this whole YouTube video series and uh, the, the, the board repair training that I've had going on, what I'm trying to do is I'm trying to reduce your dependency on outsourcing so that your business can deal with these types of hassles and issues without them becoming large you know, customer nightmare clusterfucks by being able to resolve them quickly at your own store. So I hope that that's been helpful. I hope the classes have been helpful. I hope the online free videos have been helpful in getting you one step closer to be able to deliver better service for your customers.